Hi there, my name is Yusuf Al Mustafa Muhammad. I teach chemistry at Nigerian Tulip International College and I'll be guiding you through 2020 chemistry jam questions. Okay, very well then. Let's start with the first question, shall we? The first question says, the electronic configuration of an element is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. How many unpaired electrons are there in the element? Now let's look at the options that we were provided with. Option A says five, option B says four, option C says three, and then option D says two. But then the first option is wrong. Why is it wrong? Now, you have to remember that we have four types of subshells. The S subshell, the P subshell, the D subshell, and the F subshell, okay? Now, the S subshell has only one orbital. We represent orbitals with box. Are we together? Now, each box or orbital can take a maximum of two electrons. We can conclude that the S subshell can accommodate a maximum of two electrons, isn't it? The P subshell has three orbitals or three boxes it can take a maximum of six electrons. The D subshell has five orbitals, meaning that it can take or accommodate a maximum of 10 electrons. The F subshell has seven orbital or boxes, therefore it can take a maximum of 14 electrons. But then, when fitting in orbitals or filling in orbitals with electrons, we use a rule we call the Hund's rule. And the Hund's rule states that Electrons enter degenerate orbitals singly before pairing. Meaning that if you're putting electrons, you must first of all put electrons into degenerate orbitals singly before pairing. But what do we mean by degenerate orbitals? Now, degenerate orbitals are orbitals with the same energy. The S subshell has only one orbital, so we cannot call it degenerate. It doesn't have more than one, isn't it? But for the P, D, and F, they have more than one, so all those orbitals are called degenerate, they have same energy, okay? Now back to our question, please. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3 was provided for us. The 1s, 2s, 2p orbitals, they are complete because they have all the required electrons to enter the orbital, isn't it? But the 3p, it has only three, and those three electrons can be fitted in singly, isn't it? One, two, three. But there is no more electrons to put. Therefore, how many unpaired electrons do I have? One, two, and then three. Now let's get back to our options, please. Okay, of course we said A is wrong. Option B will also be wrong. What about option D? Option D is also wrong. And then our correct answer is what? Obviously, option C. Okay, let's go to the next question, please. The next question says... Which of the following can be obtained by fractional distillation? What are the options that were provided for us? The options are as follows. A, nitrogen from liquid air. B, sodium chloride from seawater. C, iodine from solution of iodine in carbon tetrachloride. And then D, sulfur from the solution of sulfur in carbon disulfide. Now option B is wrong. Why is it wrong? Let's first of all look at what fractional distillation is, please. Now, fractional distillation is used to separate mixtures into its component parts of fractions as a result of the difference in their boiling points, okay? Now, a very good common example we know is petroleum. Petroleum has several components, isn't it? But then again, these components in petroleum can be separated by fractional distillation because they have differences in their boiling points, okay? Now, another example is liquid nitrogen and oxygen. They can be separated by fractional distillation. We have a chart here to help us understand this better. In the fractional distillation of liquefied nitrogen, we have nitrogen. Nitrogen has a boiling point of minus 190 degrees Celsius, whereas oxygen has a boiling point of minus 185 degrees Celsius. Since their boiling points are different, we can apply fractional distillation to separate the components. So let's get back to our options, please. So of course, we said B was wrong. Option C is also wrong. And then what about option D? Obviously, it's also wrong. Our correct answer should be option A. Now let's go to our next question, please. Question three says, do aluminum consist of aluminum, copper? Then we have a question mark. Question mark means that which other elements, isn't it? Option A, zinc and gold. Option B, 
lead and manganese. Option C, nickel and silver. What about option D, manganese and magnesium? Now, the question must be which of these options are not correct? Now, let's look at this, please. A is wrong, but why? Duralumin is an alloy made up of 90% aluminum, 4% copper, 0.51% magnesium, and less than 1% manganese. From the question, we were given aluminum and copper, so the remaining element must be magnesium and manganese. So, let's get back to our options, please. So, A is wrong, option B is also wrong, option C is also wrong, and obviously, the correct answer must be option D. Now, let's continue, please. The next question says, an example of a polysaccharide is, we were provided with four options as well. Option A says, dextrose. What about option B? Manus. Option C, glucose. And then option D, starch. What are the wrong options? Option A is wrong. Why? Now, listen carefully. Polysaccharides are long chains of monosaccharides linked by glycosidic bonds. This means that in polysaccharides, we have more than one monosaccharide unit linked by a glycosidic bond. And a common example of polysaccharides or common examples of polysaccharides would include starch, glycogen, and cellulose. So let's get back to our question, please. So of course, it's not dextrose. It will not be mannose. It's not glucose. Obviously, the correct answer should be starch. Okay, now let's go to our next question, please. Question number five says, eight grams of methane occupies 11.2 dm cube at standard temperature and pressure. What volume would 22 grams of propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, occupy under the same condition? What were the options that were provided? A, 3.7 dm cube, B, 11.2 dm cube, C, 22.4 dm cube, and lastly, 33 dm cube. Now option A is wrong, why? Okay. The molar mass of methane, CH4, can be calculated as carbon has an atomic mass of 12, hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1. So evaluating that into the formula, we have 12 plus 1 times 4 because we have 4 of the hydrogen, isn't it? And that will give us 16 grams per mole. Now, from the question, we were told that 8 grams of methane occupies 11.2 dm cube, isn't it? So therefore, 16 grams will occupy x. If we solve for x, I'm going to have 16 times 11.2 over 8, and that's 22.4 dm cube. Again, one mole of any gas contains a molar volume of 22.4 dm cube. So you see, one mole of methane, which has 16 grams, had 22.4 dm cube. Now let's get back to the main part of the question. The molar mass of propane, if evaluated correctly, C3H8, carbon is 12 times 3, because I have 3 atoms of carbon, isn't it? Hydrogen has a, an atomic mass of 1, so 1 times 8. In total, I'm going to have 12 times 3 plus 1 times 8. That gives me 44 grams per mole. So 44 grams per mole will occupy how many? Will occupy 22.4 dm cube, because 44 grams per mole of propane is 1 mole. I remember what I just said. 1 mole of a gas, methane and propane are all gases. So one mole of a gas will occupy 22.4 dm cube. So what if I'm now having 22 grams, because that's what the question said, instead of 44. So you see, it will be half of 22.4, which is obviously 11.2 dm cube. Alternatively, to avoid all this long solving, you can do this. Number of moles equals to volume over molar volume, okay? now. I want to find the number of mole in 22 grams of propane, okay? But then, number of mole is also mass over molar mass. The given mass was 22, so I have 22 over, what's the molar mass? We got 44. 22 divided by 44, I have 0 0.5, isn't it? At standard temperature and pressure, the molar volume is 22.4. So, making V the subject of the formula from this equation, V will be equals to number of mole times molar volume, okay? So now, what is my number of mole? 0 0.5 times what is my molar volume? Of course, 22.4. If you calculate it correctly, you're going to have 11.2 dm cube. So, let's go back. All right, we had 11.2 dm cube actually, so option A is wrong. What about the other options? Option C is also wrong. What about option D is also wrong, and the right answer must be option B. Now let's go to the next question, please. The next question says, 
the best treatment for a student who accidentally put concentrated tetraoxysulfate 6 acid on his skin in the laboratory is to wash his skin with what were the options we were provided with? Option A, with cool running water. B, sodium hydroxide solution. C, iodine solution. And then D, sodium trioxonitrate 5 solution. Now, option B is wrong. Why? Why is using sodium hydroxide solution wrong? Sulfuric acid is flushed with a mild soapy solution if the burns are not severe. Now, sulfuric acid feels hot when water is added to the acid, but it is better to flush the area and not leave the acid on the skin. So, don't try to neutralize the bone with acid or alkali. This could cause a chemical reaction that worsens the bone. So, the right thing to use is what? Running water, isn't it? So, now let's get back to our options. So, B is wrong. What about option C and D? Option C and D are also wrong, obviously, and the correct answer must be option A. Now let's go to the next question, please. The next question says, I was provided with a graph, and then question follows. The question says, which of the gas laws does this graph illustrate? A, Boyle, B, Charles, C, G. Lussac, and then D, Graham. Now, the first option is wrong. Boyle's law is wrong. Why? Now, Charles' law describes the effects of temperature changes on the volume of a given mass of gas. Be careful and observe this carefully. For Charles' law, we relate temperature and volume. Are we together? At constant pressure. So mathematically, for Charles' law, volume is directly proportional to temperature. As the volume of a gas increases, we expect the temperature to also increase, isn't it? But for Boyle's law, it relates volume and pressure, and there is inverse proportion. As volume increases, pressure decreases. So now let's get back to our options and see. From the graph, I have volume and temperature. So of course, obviously, this question is talking about Charles' law. And look at this. As the volume was increasing, the temperature was actually increasing. So the right answer must be... Of course not A, of course not C, obviously not D, but definitely B. Okay, let's look at question eight, please. The question says, what are the possible numbers of an element if its atomic number is 17? What were the options? Option A, minus one and seven, minus one and six, minus three and five, minus two and six. Of course, let's eliminate, isn't it? B is wrong, minus one and six is wrong, why? Listen carefully. The element with atomic number 17 is chlorine, if we look through our periodic table, with a valency of minus 1. Why does it have a valency of minus 1? That is, it needs to receive an electron or possibly lose 7 electrons to obey the octet rule. Of course, in chemistry, when an atom receives an electron, it becomes negatively charged. Okay? Now, in oxyacids and oxyanions, chlorine exhibits a range of positive oxidation numbers. For example, if I have HClO, this is an acid, isn't it? If I remove the hydrogen, it becomes oxyanion because there will be a negative charge. So HClO is an oxyacid. If I remove the hydrogen, there will be a negative ion, isn't it? Or negative charge, and then it becomes an oxyanion. The oxidation states of chlorine in the following compounds are as follows. Plus one, plus three, plus five, and plus seven. So we can say that Chlorine exhibits different oxidation states. But how am I getting these oxidation numbers? Listen carefully. Now, this compound is stable, it's balanced, isn't it? Because there is no charge, isn't it? Meaning the overall charge is zero. Remember, oxygen has a charge of minus two. Hydrogen has a charge of plus one as ions, isn't it? Now, minus two plus one. What do I have? Of course, I have plus one. That's why chlorine is plus one, isn't it? Now, here, what do I have? Oxygen is minus 2. Minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. Hydrogen is plus 1. So you see, minus 4 plus 1, I'm having minus 3. So chlorine must be plus 3 to, for the overall ch charge to be 0. Now here, I have oxygen as minus 2 times 3, which is minus 6. Hydrogen is plus 1. So to make everything 0, I have minus 6, I have plus 1. That's minus 5. Chlorine must be plus 5. The same thing happens here. Oxygen is minus 2, isn't it? the oxidation number. So minus 2 times 4 is minus 8. Minus 8 plus 1 from hydrogen, that's minus 7. To make minus 7 0, chlorine must be plus 7. There you go. 
Now, let's look at the options, please. Of course, option B is wrong. Option C is obviously wrong. Option D is wrong, and the correct answer is option A. So, let's go to the next question, please. The next question says, what process would coal undergo to give coal gas, coal tar, ammoniac liquor, and coke? Now, the options were, option A, steam distillation, destructive distillation, liquefaction, and then dehydrolysis. Steam distillation is wrong, but why? Destructive distillation of coal is when coal is heated in the absence of air to form four main products. What are they? Coal tar, coal gas, coke, and ammoniacal liquor. So let's get back to our option, please. Now, of course, A is wrong, C is wrong, D is wrong. Obviously, the correct answer must be option B, destructive distillation. Next question. The next question says, liquid black soap is made by boiling palm oil with liquid extract of ash. The function of the ash is to provide the, okay, options please. Option A, I have acid. B, ester of alkanoic acid. C, alkali, and then B, alkanol. Option A is wrong. Why? Let's look at this. A lye is a metal hydroxide traditionally obtained by leaching wood ashes or a strong alkali, which is highly soluble in water. From here, we see that the ashes are behaving as what our alkali. But let's continue. Now, which is highly soluble in water, producing caustic basic solutions or alkaline solution that is used to make soaps. Lye most commonly refers to sodium hydroxide, okay? So let's get back to the options, please. Of course, from what we have seen, A is wrong, B is wrong, D is wrong, and obviously the correct answer must be option C.